Hello and welcome to the Pandemic Action Network Spotlight on Dr. Amelia Burke Garcia, Communicating Through a Pandemic's author. Um, we are just ensuring that everybody has the right link and is getting to the right place. So I'm going to go on mute um, just as we get folks into the room. Thank you and welcome for being here today. Hello and welcome again to the Pandemic Action Network special event, um, talking to Dr. Amelia Burke Garcia, the author of Communicating Through a Pandemic and also a special sort of double event for our Behavior Change Communications work group. We are observing that there's been a little bit of a kerfuffle with the correct Zoom link, so we're going to just take a couple of seconds to make sure that everybody can get to the right place, including our guest of honor. So we will just take another couple of minutes here before we get started. Thank you. And while we're waiting, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Feel free to pop in a greeting with your name, your affiliation, uh, your location, how you're feeling today, et cetera. Thank you and welcome. Hello, greetings, welcome. As more folks are filing into the room and we're making sure our guest of honor has the correct link, I wanna welcome you all to the Pandemic Action Network special event, spotlighting Dr. Amelia Burke Garcia, talking about her new book, Communicating Through a Pandemic, and also this special double event, 
um, with our regularly scheduled behavior change communications work group. If you haven't already got an opportunity to share a greeting, I invite you in the chat to drop in your name, your organization, where you're coming in from today, how you're feeling, um, anything you want to share with the group. And really, this time is all of our time. So as you're inspired today's discussion and you want to share your own stories and experiences, the chat is going to be open throughout for exactly that. So hello and welcome. Great seeing everybody here today. Let me do a quick scan to see if we've been able to get in our guest of honor. Oh, yes. She, Amelia she's is, here. She just has your name, Darcy. She has my name on the screen. Um, so I am I just changed it. <laughs> and she changed it because you know what? She's that good with technology. So, <laughs> so happy to have you here. And as we get started in, in today's discussion, I do want to just everyone agreed and acknowledges that we've got the recording going. I know folks are going to want to listen to this after. Um, we have this wonderful discussion. Um, I also want to give an acknowledgement and a shout out to, I see many of you here, members of the Behavior Change Communications Work Group. Um, this is something that we meet once a month and share best practices and, and learnings from um, pandemics and from behavior change and relevant behaviors. We hear from practitioners from academia, from, from folks all around the globe. And so if you are not yet part of the BCC work group and this conversation today it appeals to you and you want to get involved, please reach out to, the, to myself or to the Pandemic Action Network. And with that, I am Darcy. I am an AVP at Evoke Kind, and I chair the Behavior Change Communications Work Group, an honor I've had since the founding of this fantastic network. Um, and I am so excited about our conversation today and what we have for you. We get to really dive in and hear from Dr. Amelia Burke Garcia on her new book, Communicating Through a Pandemic. So Amelia is the Director of Digital Strategy and Outreach at NORC at the University of Chicago. In that role, she's led the How Right Now campaign for CDC and CDC Foundation. Um, some of you know that NORC is a Pandemic Action Network member and is uh, one of the largest independent social research organizations in the United States. Uh, and I've known Amelia for years. Uh, actually, Amelia, my first memory of, of learning about you was the use of um, meetups and mommy bloggers and the back in the early days of some of this digital innovation. In that context, it was around improving flu vaccination rates. But I was, I've was i always been inspired by your pioneering use of digital strategy to improve public health. Um, and I do recommend her first book, which is called Influencing Health. It's about social media influencers. And then on Friday, I had the opportunity to finish uh, her second book, which I highly recommend. It's what we're all here for today. Let's get into it, communicating through a pandemic. Uh, so Amelia, you start your book with a Socrates quote. It is, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Just to kick us off, like, can you share why you decided to start here with this book about communicating through a pandemic? And then really the floor is yours to share other key learnings from the work. Okay, great. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Darcy, for that lovely um, introduction. And the feeling is mutual. I've always been inspired by your work and your commitment to behavior change and health communication. Um, I also just want to thank the Pandemic Action Network for hosting me today and, all, and for all of you for showing up. I'm really excited for this conversation. So um, yes, I sort of, one of the, uh, the first parts of this book does start out with um, a Socrates quote, and um, it is important to note that each of the chapters uh, have, uh, um, each has a their own quote that sort of encompasses, I think, like the spirit of what is meant to um, be shared in each of those chapters. Um, I think I started out with that because the beginning part of the book is very much focused on sort of my personal experiences and sort of what brought me to um, this place of wanting to sort of document a little bit, and I, I say a little bit because it, it, it um, I, you know, this is my book and it is, um, uh, and it, ha it shares a number of perspectives from um, across a number of topics, but it is by no means expansive in terms of, of all of that we have been through in the pandemic. Um, but I, I, you know, as I will share in a few minutes, I did prepare a few slides for you all. Um, 
one of my um, sort of aims with this book was to really kind of articulate some of the similarities um, that COVID has had with prior pandemics, but also some of the differences um, that we've, and, and, and how those have sort of uh, rolled out in, in this uh, environment and, and um, through this whole experience. And, and, and then on top of that, what we need to do differently, what needs to change um, as we move forward. And I like the idea of, the, of not fighting the old, of looking forward and having a message of hope and a message of, of what can be done and not feeling like we are sort of entrenched um, in, in processes and ways of thinking that can't be undone. And so um, I think the spirit of that was sort of to, to process a little bit of what I had been through, um, what perhaps all of us have been through in some capacity, and then to really start to look at how do we build a foundation for understanding this entire experience and, and where do we go from here? So um, that's, I think, the spirit of, of using that quote. Um, and, and so with that, I will actually just share my screen and kind of um, share with you just a few thoughts. Again, I, I want this to be a discussion, so this isn't meant to be overly, give me one second while I put this into screen share or slide mode. Um, and Darcy, if you could just shake your head yes or no, can you see the slides? Um, uh, yes, I can see the slides, but they're not yet in slideshow mode. Okay. Um... Yeah, they are. Okay. Yep. Well, we can see the slide that's coming next, but at least I can. That's all right. <laughs> um, all right. One second, let me see if I can move this. Does that look better? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh. Okay. So I, before we dig into some of what I've learned through this process and kind of sort of the high points of what I wanted to share with you all today, I want to just take a, a minute to pause and I want you all to sort of calm your minds and I want to start with a question, which is, when you think back over the last many years now, several years, more than three, um, or almost more than three, uh, to when you first heard about, or you first learned about COVID-19, maybe it was not called COVID-19 at, at, the, at the time. Um, if you feel like you wanna share, share that those moments um, in the chat. I want you to think about where you were, what you were doing, how you heard about it. Was it through a media story? Was it through a colleague? Was it through a friend or a family member? And how did you feel? Like, what were your um, uh, thoughts about what this meant for us? What did you, did you worry? Did you take it seriously? Did you sort of laugh it off? Um, I remember so clearly the moment that I learned and first heard about COVID-19, and it was not called COVID-19 at that time. It was a, a virus that was emerging and it was emerging in China halfway across the world and it was in December of 19, 2019. And I remember it was early one morning and I was sitting on my couch and I was scrolling through the news on my phone and it this article caught my eye and I started to read about it and I'm sure that it had been in the news prior to that but for whatever moment that was the moment that I started to pay attention. Um, but the article said two things. It said there's this new virus and it's not in the US yet and you don't have to worry. And my thinking at the time was, okay, here's another virus. It's another virus that has popped up. And if you work in public health, you've probably worked through many uh, outbreaks, epidemics, pandemics over the course of your life, right? You've, you've probably um, experienced that. If not fully focused on it, you've heard about it or you've heard others that um, have worked on these kinds of things. So in my mind, I thought, okay, here's another virus. We don't know what it is. We're gonna keep learning. And I kind of moved on from it. The, the second part about it not being in the US was the thing that caught my eye um, more so than the, the um, emergence of this new virus. And, and it was because I thought, how could it not be here yet? Of course it had to be here. And I, and I just was sort of surprised by the, the, um, um, the, 
uh, intention with which um, that statement was made. And, and so, you know, I finished reading the article and moved on to my day, got ready for work, went to work, moved on into the holiday season and into the new year and really didn't, you know, kind of, I mean, there were continued to be news stories and, and, but did not think that in three or four months down the line, our lives would be um, upended the way that they were. So in some ways, I think that COVID-19 and the COVID-19 pandemic has been one pandemic in a long line of other ones that have come before it. We've used very similar mitigation measures um, that have been used in other pandemics. Uh, so we've social distance, we've been told to wash our hands, we've masked up and we've gotten vaccinated. All of those things are things that we are likely all familiar with and we've, we've seen them used um, in prior uh, outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics. And if we look closely, the communication strategies that have been employed in this pandemic have also been similar to other prior pandemics. So just to give you a few examples, this is the, um, uh, the, the headline for the Duluth Herald um, during the 1918 influenza pandemic, and they're restricting um, public gatherings. So they're social distancing, right? They're trying to get people not to get together. Um, if you look at the HIV AIDS um, epidemic, uh, yes, the messaging, of course, has shifted. There have been a lot of changes in therapeutics over the years. So we've gone from a conversation around HIV AIDS to HIV only. We've talked a lot about, um, now we talk about PrEP and we talk about prevention um, strategies and, 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 and we have new messages. But you can see that over time, the, the, the messaging, the awareness, the, the sort of the type of messaging, right? The, the awareness messaging, the educational me messaging, that still exists. And the formats, right? So maybe things are in digital now, but the idea of posters or advertisements or advertorials, those kinds of tools have been used for decades. This is a poster um, from the UK during H1N1. Um, and it's, uh, you know, promoting covering your cough so that you don't spread germs. Again, covering your cough, a very consistent message, use of posters, um, use of imagery um, to convey key prevention um, health messaging. These are uh, posters and billboards from the Ebola um, uh, pandemic. Um, and again, you see the promotion of symptom recognition and you know, it's sort of hidden by the, the, the purple ad, but it's, you know, protect yourself and your community. Those same messages are ones that we continuously use um, in it today and, and have used in the COVID-19 pandemic. And then this is a Zika uh, airport sign. And again, it's sort of how do you prevent uh, transmission, right? How do you protect yourself against getting Zika? So um, the communication strategies in over 100 years are very similar, and we, we continue to use very similar approaches. But I want to actually pause and ask you a different question. And that question is about, can you recall the moment when you would be asked to, that you were going to have to social distance? You're going to be asked to socially distance from your family, from your friends, uh, not going to work, not go to restaurants, not go to the gym, uh, not, your kids wouldn't go to school. And, I'm, and I want you to think back to that moment. And again, feel free to share in the chat your personal experiences. And I want you to think of where, what were your thoughts at that time? Were you worried? Were you angry? Were you scared? You didn't know what was going on? Um, because I think this is where we start to see the differences between the COVID-19 pandemic and pandemics from the past. So I'm wondering, you know, do you, do, you, do you or somebody you know or love, did they worry about um, having to go to work and, and get sick or bring um, uh, potentially bring the virus home? Did they worry about not being able to work and not being able to pay bills? Did they worry about managing work and school, remote work and remote school for their kids? Uh, did they worry about having to remote work and not having um, very good or at all access to the internet? Um, yes, COVID has been universal. We have all experienced COVID. 
And in many cases, we've experienced very similar aspects of COVID, but all of our experiences have been so unique in this pandemic. And so it really sort of drives home how COVID has amplified the unique lived experiences of different people, no matter uh, based on where you live, what job you do, how much money you make, and what the color of your skin may be. Context has mattered. If there's one thing we've learned in this pandemic, it's that context has mattered. It has informed what information we have access to. So whether that's through because of the digital divide or because um, of the, the sort of diffuse media environment we're in and who we follow and where we go to get our information, we haven't necessarily all had access to the same kinds of information framed in the same way so that we can all have the same understanding of what's going on. This has really impacted what we think and what we've believed about the pandemic. Do we believe in vaccination? Will vaccines be effective? Do we think that we should wear a mask? Do we think COVID is real? It's informed um, who we trust for information, where we first hear about things and who do we go back to, to hear more and to learn more. It's impacted the choices that we've had to make. And I specifically use the words that we have had to make because in many cases, the choices we've made in the pandemic haven't always been driven by our own desires, right? They, they might be driven by other motivating factors, paying our bills, taking care of our children, caring for a sick loved one, worrying about access to healthcare or consistent access to medicine. And uh, it's really impacted how we've acted and reacted. So yes, those behavioral decisions we've made, but also just sort of our interactions with one another. We've seen an, a substantial increase in hate crimes during the pandemic. We've seen tremendous fighting and aggression in uh, between people and amongst groups of people because, um, because of the information that people are absorbing and how they're believing and thinking about that information. And all of those communication strategies that we've that have we've used in COVID and that have been similar to prior pandemics, yes, those may that may be true. But we also have seen messaging that in this pandemic has appeared to be more confusing, more contradictory, more convoluted, and in some cases downright false, more so than in any other pandemic prior to that. And so you see here sort of the mass debate um, uh, going on. This is two headlines, three months apart, um, about wearing masks. And we've gone rounds on mask wearing uh, multiple times during the pandemic. And while I can't say that mis and disinformation did not exist in prior pandemics, it certainly has uh, existed at a level and at a, at, a, at a speed in this pandemic, like uh, unlike anything that has come before it. So yes, context has mattered. And this is really why I wrote this book, to really highlight the similarities and the differences um, that, that have sort of comprised this pandemic experience, but also to highlight what needs to, what needs to be changed. Because I really do think that we need to reconceptualize um, how we think about surveillance. Yes, we monitor virus spread and infection rate, but I also think that we really need to be thinking about how we can more consistently and iteratively and longitudinally understand what communities are going through, what they're thinking, what they're believing, what they're hearing, who they trust. And yes, we do some of that social epidemiological work now, but not at the scale and at the uh, cadence that I think is important for us to be able to understand issues as they emerge and um, how to work with communities, not in an emergency, but before the emergency happens so that we're not just showing up on people's doorsteps, asking them to do something when we haven't talked to them ever before. We've never been on that doorstep before. And we also need to, to embrace a different kind of communications culture. And what this means is that, yes, science is, is always intending to um, provide truth and provide information and have that information be accurate and reliable. Um, but it's slow and pandemics move fast. And so I think we need to embrace a more nimble and responsive communications culture that gets real comfortable with the real discomfort of not knowing. And so we um, are able to sort of provide information um, that is um, transparent 
and acknowledges that it may be time bound. So what is true today and what we know today may not be, it, that may not be the case in two weeks or two days or two hours. And then we are upfront about those things with people. I also think this has to do with who's at the table and not just who's at the table and whose voices are included. Yes, we need to have um, the right voices and the voices of people who are disproportionately impacted at the table. But it also means allowing for strategies and for approaches to be designed by the people for whom those strategies and, appro and approaches are for, are intended. And I think that in doing so, you start to create um, this new communications culture that serves the needs of people who, are, who, who need it, who um, need the support the most. And we need to address the mis and disinformation crisis. And yes, this involves policy change and it involves conversations with tech companies. Um, but I think it also comes down to trust. And I think it, 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 as you start to think about these three things and how they hang together, if we're engaging with communities and we're talking with them and we've got the right voices at the table and we are allowing for strategies to be designed by the people for whom those strategies are intended, then we start to build that trust. And we also then start to address the issues of mis and disinformation. So context matters. It has always mattered and it has mattered in this pandemic and it will continue to matter. But I think that there are things that we can start to do um, that will help us do our jobs better and really address the, the realities and the lived experiences that people have gone through in this pandemic in order to be able to support and provide the right kinds of um, uh, uh, resources and, and foundations for this work as it moves into the future. This is just a little bit more about me. I'm not gonna read it to you. <laughs> I'm gonna say thank you. And I'm gonna turn it back to Darcy so we can have a little chat. Absolutely. Well, I thank you so much, Amelia. And, and I also just have to note how accessible your book is, how clean and easy of a read is. So I highly recommend it to everybody. And as you may have seen in the chat, one lucky person here today is going to be get sent a book. So stay on to the end of the conversation. We'll do a raffle and you too will get an opportunity to get an early uh, copy of communicating through a pandemic. So the, one of the chapters that I just like was out with my highlighter and reading was where you really talk about the crisis and emergency risk communication framework and people in our field, I would say are sort of very trained in this framework that, that emerged from the CDC and it seems to be very in use. Um, but you do question if it still fits in today's sort of always on connected environment. So after having gone through the exercise of the book, what would you like to see happen with that framework so it works better for us moving forward? Right. Yeah. And, and this is a, a big, big question, right? And I think it requires um, more voices than just mine. But here are some preliminary thoughts. Um, I don't necessarily think that the CERC framework as it is, is wrong. I don't think that it, that it we should throw it out, right? I think we just need to rethink the key constructs that comprise this framework and how they um, are really operationalized in today's environments. And I'll just give you sort of two examples. The first is has to do with the first tenant, which is to be first. And I would argue that right now, I'm not sure how relevant that is anymore, because even if you are first, but nobody sees that mm -hmm. because they don't follow you, because they seek out information through other channels, um, I I'm not sure how important it is, right? Like, yes, I understand in theory, the idea behind being first, you want to get out there with your message before other people have a chance to get out there with counter messaging. Um, that said, I think counter messaging is sort of, oh, and somebody's asking about the full name. I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, it, so I think that, you know, um, if, if people are just not following your information, it sort of doesn't matter if you're first, mm -hmm. right? Because if you get out there second, if you get out there third, if somebody's already out there talking about something, which we've seen this not just in emergency communication or pandemic communication, this happens on all sorts of health topics, that the conversations and the counter conversations happen whether or not we are there and present. Um, I think for me, the important point there is really about being transparent. 
and about working with partners and around working with people who, who are those channels and trusted voices that people do follow. So for me, it becomes a strategy less about being first and more about being engaged with the right players for, for, the, for the communities you're seeking to serve. The other one is about showing respect. And in the CERC framework, it is, it is loosely defined what showing respect means. Um, and while I think that it's not a bad tenant at all to, to show respect, I'm not sure that it fully art articulates what we need to be doing to be respectful, right? Being respectful is not a matter of necessarily just language. Um, it's a matter of inclusion. It's a matter of who's driving the decision-making. It's a matter of, um, uh, you know, what are we what are we building and why are we building it? Who is it being built for? How are we communicating that? And I think that um, expanding on that idea of showing respect, um, we really need to do a better job of, of articulating mm -hmm. that and and re and really thinking about what that means in today's environment and in the context of communities that have historically been marginalized from the conversations and from the decision making. You obviously pull out a lot of your direct personal experience working on the How Right Now campaign for CDC. And throughout, it is mostly from a US-based, United States-based lens. But obviously, the Pandemic Action Network is global. The, the actual pandemic was quite global. So in writing your book, just do you have any of the things that you thought were sort of lessons from your experience which are globally ac applicable or any of the cases that you looked at outside of the U.S. that you think are particularly inspirational? Yeah, and I think it's important to be upfront. Like I'm an American. I went through the pandemic in the U.S., right? So a lot of the perspectives I share are from my perspective and, um, and, but that said, I think that there are uh, many places where I pull in data or stories or experiences um, from other countries and, um, and even from um, like multiple countries. So just a couple of examples on that front. Um, when I talk about the mis and disinformation issues and crises, that we're experiencing and sort of overall sort of the challenges that we've experienced in the US, I actually provide as counterpoints um, stories and, and lessons learned from um, uh, Iceland and New Zealand, two countries that have uh, um, in the pandemic had historically low deaths per capita. And yet they were two different countries, two different sizes located across the globe from each other and took the two very different approaches to pandemic response. New Zealand took a very sort of uh, uh, intentional, uh, you know, approach to close borders, to restrict access, you know, to sort of really shut down um, uh, their country. Iceland uh, did mass screenings, uh, made access to testing readily available, um, but they both had similar outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so, but what they both had was trust in, uh, they had the public's trust and they had high levels of, pu of, of public trust. And so looking at the examples of Iceland and New Zealand as a counterpoint to what we've experienced here is one model for how I sort of integrate my experiences and what we've experienced here in the U.S. with others across, you know, the globe. Similarly, uh, with the mental health crisis that has uh, kind of emerged throughout the, through the pandemic um, and the toll that the pandemic has taken on people's uh, mental health, um, I draw from, you know, it's again, we, uh, this was a big area for me throughout the pandemic because how right now is a mental health coping and resilience campaign. So we had a lot of data from, from working on that campaign around the issue in the U.S. Um, however, that was not just a U.S. issue, right? So I uh, provide data and tell stories around the mental health challenges, especially for youth and young adults mm -hmm. um, from China, from Slovenia, uh, from Spain. So I, I, I pull in data um, to show that there are elements, again, from this pandemic, that while the individual experiences may be different, there are global implications of how this pandemic has rolled out. And the final example, which I think we'll talk a little bit more, is when I talk about the different campaigns, the communication type campaigns, the pandemic response campaigns that have 
um, been initiated, I do include campaigns from the UK, um, the World Health Organization, which again is global, and then I also include Chile. And so, and and Chile is being a very um, unique way of running a campaign, right? Very different than how we run campaigns in the United States. So yes, you know, this is a book with a with a heavy um, lens on what I know and what I have experienced and as, as a, as a U.S. based person. Um, but I was try I did really try and be intentional with bringing in stories and experiences and data from, um, other countries and other people who are not U.S. based. I'm so glad you brought up Chile's vaccination campaign, because of course that was another place where I was like, ding, 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 because the way I read it is they actually address the idea of making vaccination easier than the places and the spaces and the incentives and the social norming around it. And then the communications was brought in just to sort of promote those things rather than doing all the heavy lifting of driving people towards towards vaccination. Is there anything else that you want to share from that case study that you think is useful for this group? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the idea that so so just to make sure for everyone, um, Chile had a very intentional um, campaign that was focused on sort of the operations of vaccination, right? So they brought the vaccine to universities, to sports stadiums. They had a, a, a national calendar for who could get vaccinated uh, when. They had a national registry that kind of documented everyone's vaccination status. Um, they used very, um, I don't want to say simple, but they were sort of logistical operational methods to um, get people vaccinated. And they're, they are one of the standout um, campaigns and, or efforts um, of the pandemic in terms of their vaccination work. Um, I think what is interesting is that, you know, and, and again, comparing it to the U.S., where so much differed, right? The approaches to managing and responding to this pandemic differed so widely um, based on the state that you lived in, the county you lived in, the city you lived in. And so this idea that there could be this national response that would just make, bring the vaccines to people to where they go, where they mm -hmm. congregate is one of the principles of behavior mm -hmm. change theory, right? It's like, make it fun, easy, and popular, right? That's what they did. Um, and I think that by doing that, you alleviate the burden on communicators for having mm -hmm. to communicate both the whys and the what's and the hows, right? The hows were they got, those were sort of a well-oiled machine and then the communicators could sort of um, amplify the hows with, with the what's and the why's. And I think that that, by, by removing that, you sort of allow the communicators to focus on the messaging and the mm -hmm. and, and sort of the other aspects of behavior change theory that really um, can, can drive people to, to take the steps that we hope that they take to protect themselves and their families. Um, I think it's much harder when you are in a country like the U.S. where not all states have the same policies, not all cities and counties have the same resource levels. And, and so um, doing this in that same kind of consistent way can be a, more difficult. And so it puts the onus of mm -hmm. that on the communicators a lot of the times. I think it makes the role of communication very um, important. Um, it also, though, means that and to the point of the presentation I just gave, context becomes incredibly important mm -hmm. and your message becomes hyper-localized, right? Because what works for one person here is not always gonna be meaningful to somebody else in another place. Absolutely. And, and to that end, if you're interested in this concept and this concept of consistency around wayfinding, this is actually going to be a topic at our next BCC meeting on May 18th. So please, I hope to see you there. I'm going to just wrap my question and I'm starting to see questions in the chat, which is just how do you visualize how you have this vision that you've painted for what's coming up ahead or what you think should happen? How do you see these kinds of networks like the Pandemic Action Network, groups that were formed specifically to break the cycle of panic and neglect, of picking up the torch and getting the, the job done to be able to fare better the next go around? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think that the pan, you know, or, uh, 
uh, networks or organizations like um, the Pandemic Action Network are doing that, right? Like this is their point. The way that they are built, made up of member organizations um, of who are comprised, uh, which are comprised of people and experts and SMEs and and um, uh, thought leaders who are who are really trying to think about this differently. Um, that is sort of, I think, the the foundation for where we need to go. I also think it's really notable. Um, I read a, a white paper from the Pandemic Action Network. Um, this is from a little while ago, um, and it was called "From Charity to Sol Solidarity," mm -hmm. and it was very much focused on low and middle income countries. But it talked about a lot of the same things that I think. I articulated um, in my book, right? So uh, we use different words and we sort of, it's it's sort of framed a little bit differently, but this idea of um, equitable governance, right? Of sort of bringing the right people to the table and letting people make the decisions for the things that impact them. Um, that's very much a theme of, of, of where I think we need to go as well. I also think this idea of putting the people back or the public back in public health um, and the moving beyond the me first. I, I talk a, a bit about this in the book as well, this idea that, you know, it's sort of a maybe a softer or a fluffier thing, but having compassion for one another. Somewhere along the way, we kind of lost this, this uh, our, our sort of our ability to, to care and to sort of have empathy for the fact that like not everyone is going through what we're going through and people are in different situations and and sort of this idea of having compassion and sort of putting others first and thinking about the global impact when we are in a such an interconnected world, um, thinking only about our space and our place and and acting sort of more as islands, we 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 will fail, right? We will fail. Like we, the viruses don't know the boundaries of time and space. And so um, we need to work together. We need to move beyond the me, for, the me first, right? To move to a more, uh, a bigger focus on, on how we are uh, the collective in this. And so I think that all of those foundational pieces are being set by the work that the Pandemic Action Network and other organizations are doing. I think where the rubber meets the road is going to be on resource allocation. Mm -hmm. And I think committing to um, the, the resources, both in terms of dollars, but also personnel, staff, training, bring the right people in. Um, we need to be thoughtful about uh, making the, the investment in this as because it, it to show that it's important. Um, and I don't think that we've invested in the work that we do in a way that allows us to be prepared for the next one. And so whatever we can do as a, as a community to advocate for um, these approaches, but also the funding of these approaches now and into the future, without that, we'll be back where, we, where we've been. And, um, and, but I think that there's a committed group of people here um, and, and who could help advocate out for the, that kind of support. Um, and so again, in terms of not fighting the old and looking forward to the future, building the new, that's where we got to go. Oh, absolutely. Here, here. And to that point, Chris, you did pose the question, tell me what you mean, what you said at the outset, build the new, not fighting the old. Is there anything else that you want to, you know, double click on that statement, Amelia? Um, I mean, I just think that, uh, you know, one of the big things I would just say, and I, I ended my book this way, is sort of like a brava to the to the public health community. I think that they've taken a lot of uh, hits in the last couple of years and before that as well. And I don't think people see how much work that goes into what they do and they have a big job and, and, and you know, they are a village and I use this, this uh, uh, metaphor in the book, but they are a village. They are a small group of committed, passionate people, but they are a village because they are a small group doing a very big job. And so getting the right support to do this work better is what we need to be focused on. Um, Brandy has a question. Brandy, feel free to um, unmute yourself uh, about misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. Hi, Amelia. Hi, Darcy and the team. Um, I was just curious, you know, it was really interesting to hear about your comments um, more towards the beginning of the presentation, thinking about, um, you know, building community trust, thinking about misinformation, disinformation. There's times where I think, especially on a local level, 
um, public health officials can feel kind of powerless to cope with the media environment in which their constituents and their communities are operating. Um, you know, with the exception of technology reform, conversations with, um, you know, broadcasters, technology platforms, what do you think that communicators um, and public health officials can do to kind of help shape the environment in which their constituents are getting information? Because I think trust ends up being so central to some of those discussions. Yeah, um, I think it's that's such a great question. And I think what you're hitting on is this issue that I think, especially at the local levels, um, our, our pub, you know, we train our public health professionals in school, and then we send them out to do this very big job in a very complicated environment. And I think sometimes we, you know, uh, and I am, I am guilty of this too, right? I love the theories of behavior change. I love the theories of health communication, but not everything always has to be theoretical, right? And I think uh, really unpacking for people who are working at local levels, what are the nimble ways to be able to, to do your job and how do you be efficient and, and be data-driven and, 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 you know, be based in evidence, but also recognizing that like, not everything has to be sort of this referendum on, on what's going on, right? It's there, there, we've got to, um, instill or, 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 and, and train up our, our staff to, um, both have, the theoretical knowledge, but I think more of the day-to-day -day management knowledge. And, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes we miss, we miss that in, in how we um, both train and in how, in what we expect from um, public health professionals um, in, 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 in certain types of roles. So I, you know, for me, it comes down to both uh, a set of not just initial training, but also ongoing training to allow staff to sort of understand um, what the environment is like, and then how can they be more nimble in that environment? And that's not always the lengthy, you know, theory-based study or the creating models. It, it may be more sort of hands-on day-to-day uh, -day operations uh, skills that, that we can help build up. Um, Alyssa, do you mind unmuting and asking your really excellent question? Hi, yes, happy to. Um, so you mentioned a need to like tackle this information and engage with tech companies in your talk earlier. And from experience, kind of just looking at how they've responded in the past, especially social media companies, they're, I think, better at engaging with like countries like the US and those in the European Union where there's a lot of power within those places to kind of get them to change their practices. But for regions outside of that, and especially those that don't have English speaking populations, there's kind of a rampant um, flow of, of missing disinformation that they are much less able to address. And so just curious what like the public health sector um, can do to change the behaviors, policies, and practices of tech companies to better serve in the public interest in this respect. Yeah, and and I, you know, I think that that is a is a again, I'll just these are really big questions, right? And I think that they require uh, a lot of input from um, a variety of perspectives. I certainly think that one of the roles that um, U.S., U.K., other um, uh, similar type countries um, can help do is in, in modeling and sort of um, advocating for some of these um, conversations that need to happen on behalf of other countries where the power dynamic may um, not be as um, balanced or um, there just may not be the right leadership to sort of have those kinds of conversations. Um, I think um, looking to how, you know, thinking about misinformation as, as also not driven by geographic boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. There are limitations, of course, in how different social media companies operate within different countries, but um, thinking about the issue of mis and disinformation as global and not necessarily just country by country may also help us in, in formulating how we approach this, not just, again, not as a me first, but as a, how, how do we start to have these conversations on behalf of 
um, multiple countries, um, especially ones that may not be able to advocate for themselves. Thank you. And then Chris, I think I'm going to let your question be the last one we ask out loud. Do you mind getting off mute and asking? Um, you're muted. I'm muted. There we go. I apologize. It's a fascinating conversation. I have worked alongside Dr. David Navarro during the pandemic. I'm not a public health professional. I work more in climate communications. And I'm wondering, Emily, when you talk about building the new, whether you're also thinking about moving from linear climate science based communications to more about what a non linear connected model would look like. And I wonder whether you think there are any parallels from the lessons from the public health emergencies for the climate emergencies in terms of communications and engagement. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, climate has faced um, a lot of issues with regards to um, getting people to understand urgency, um, mis and disinformation, um, the science around what are the steps that I could take as an individual versus like sort of national or global policy. Um, I certainly think that this idea of, um, you know, creating um, a, a way, a mechanism for understanding what people, like how those concerns are um, are shifting is in, is incredibly important. Um, I also think that um, being able to to um, climate is is different depending on the issues around climate change are different depending on where you're talking about. So that nimble and um, iterative and responsive communications culture, I think, works well when we think about the climate um, space as well. So um, I think that there are lessons learned for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think the experience of the the COVID-19 pandemic being so long does make us rethink about how to kind of deal with these kinds of communications because and for, instead of getting somebody through a month-long crisis, but instead, how do we, you know, stay safe and prepare over a length of time seems very relevant to climate change. So, Thank you for all your excellent questions. Feel free to continue to drop them in the chat. You have Amelia's contact information from the previous slide, and maybe you could drop it in here too, because we definitely believe in these conversations continuing. But to wrap us up, I'm going to turn us over to Autumn Lerner from the Pandemic Action Network. Uh, thanks, Darcy. And thank you so much, Amelia. And for all of you who have um, joined from around the world, I know it is quite late for many of you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful that we're having this conversation. It's one of the reasons that we continue to gather this group of communicators each month. Um, and it's also the reason that Pandemic Action Network exists, that we're, we're here to ensure that the lessons of COVID actually translate into real systemic change and that we uh, can realize a future where we're, we're better prepared to respond to pandemic threats to prevent them where we can and ensure that outbreaks don't turn into pandemics in the first place, but that we're also um, prepared from a communications perspective to respond. Because one of the things that we saw in COVID is uh, the first tool we have in our toolkit is communication. We don't have vaccines. We have our ability to message so that we can do the things to protect ourselves in terms of physical distancing, masking, all behavior change communications pieces. And that's why this, our, our working group dedicated to behavior change comms started when we started Pandemic Action Network in April of 2020. And we have continued since because communications has to be a part of our efforts to pandemic proof our future. We're working on, on so many areas on government, on governance, on finance, on kind of the ecosystem of preparedness. Communications needs to be threaded through that. So just three things that have come up uh, through Amelia's talk that really sparked for me. Um, one was when you talked about always on. Um, we've actually had a lot of communications and conversations just over the past week about always on pandemic preparedness. And thinking about what that looks for, like from a communications perspective is quite interesting. Um, and so much of it is at the micro level. 
It's at the local level. This is what Always On looks like, building that trust on the front lines. Um, and that really takes those workers and, and um, frontline healthcare workers, et cetera, being in communities, knowing communities when an emergency happens. Um, and then at the macro level, you talked about network. We are a network ourselves. And this is really about going from, as you said, me to we, or going to the collective. Um, and, and doing that you know, has, a, has a collective power and a collective force. But I think what you called out is where the rubber meets the road. It's really about resources. In order for us to do that, there needs to be more resources invested in advance, not only when we're in crisis mode, um, but when we're not in crisis mode so that countries, communities are better equipped to be resilient to crises when they happen, be them a health crisis and or um, as Chris raised, a climate related crisis, which is often then tied to a health crisis because these are intersecting issues. You know, we're seeing around the world in Malawi right now, cholera outbreaks, as a result of climate change induced flooding. And there, there is a, um, a triggering and trickling effect of all of these things. So we need to ensure that the most vulnerable communities actually have the resources to invest in advance so that they can be more resilient when these crises inevitably happen. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you to all of you who have joined today. Um, it's been really an inspiring conversation and let's ensure that communications continues to be infused in our collective efforts. Um, I put it in the chat earlier, but if you're not part of our behavior change communications working group and you are interested to be a part of that community, please just email us. We're very open and collaborative and we want you there. So please join us. Um, this work is so important and together we do achieve more. Thank you. Back to you, Darcy. Yeah, so with that note, our next meeting is going to be on May 18th at this same time. We've already got in a couple of incredible speakers lined up for you. And also just generally an open invitation. If you or someone you know is doing a really incredible work either on the, in, the, in the field, on the ground, or in academia that is um, useful, that really helps us go from sort of lessons documented to really real true learning and application, please join us and recommend folks for future uh, screeners. And now I bet you all want to know who gets the free book. So Justin has a random generator, a raffle thing to figure out who is the winner um, of the free book. And I'll turn it over to you, Justin. Awesome. Thank you. Just let me share my screen really quick. And then, awesome, can you all see it? Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Umberto! <laughs> and let me do it just a quick scan to see if, yes, Umberto's still here. Umberto, do you want to um, get off mute and accept your prize? I mean, I don't know what to say, but yes, exciting. I'm so I was like, I need to go look this book up and go uh, buy it. But now I have won it. So there you go. Now I have to, I have to uh, um, read this book ASAP. But we will get in touch with you and uh, get that information um, so that we can get that to you in short order. So with that, we are at time. My deepest gratitude to you, Amelia, for writing this book. I went, read every page of it. I went, I was like, how did she have the discipline to not only do all of this work, but to capture all of these learnings, these feelings that just resonate um, with so many people. And so I commend you for that and also encourage as many of you as possible to follow Amelia's lead. We've been through so much. We've learned through so much. Let's capture it. Let's share it and let's learn from it. So with that, I'm going to conclude this wonderful session and wish you all a fantastic rest of your day and week. Adios, au revoir, sayonara. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen.